Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. Um, Policy and Politics has always been one of my favourite journals, and uh, not only because uh, it's published uh, quite a few of my articles over the years, um, but also because many of my closest colleagues, when I worked at the University of Bristol, Alison Shaw, uh, Randall Smith, uh, have been deeply involved uh, in its production, and it is, uh, and it's always a good read, um, and I'm sure will continue to be under its new editorship. Um, what I want to talk about uh, is. Uh, the title is helpfully put up there, uh, is about paternalism. Um, and um, uh, as some of you may have noticed, I'm actually wearing a, a, a cast. Now, this is a, a deliberate strategy uh, because it will be uh, as a kind of visual aid uh, for the uh, theme that I wish to pursue. Um, I actually got it because uh, I'm suffering with this cast because uh, of a bicycle accident. I, I've cycled for 30 years um, uh, success, reasonably successfully in London and elsewhere. I uh, never had an accident, but uh, cycling down a, um, uh, a small country road in Provence uh, and uh, on an electric bike, as a matter of fact, which I can hardly recommend, apart from one or two problems with it. Um, the, uh, and I was going down a hill too fast. I'm an overconfident cyclist. Um, and indeed, I'd even, I just had a conversation with, uh, with some of my friends I was cycling with uh, about there being two kinds of cyclists. Um, those who, uh, when going down a hill, put their brakes on, uh, and those who, when going down a hill, take their brakes off. I think you can probably guess which kind I am. Um, and I was going down the hill far too fast, came to a corner uh, and came off. Um, but it does relate to my fundamental question. Now, um, as a result of doing that, um, I have imposed costs upon the world. I've imposed costs actually on the French health service. will probably be ultimately reimbursed by the British health service, but... Uh, uh, I've imposed costs on that. I've imposed costs on my family who have to fuss around doing things. I may impose costs on you when I fiddle around unsuccessfully with the, uh, uh, with the PowerPoint presentation using my left hand because I'm right-handed. Uh, and um, and I clearly I've imposed substantial costs on myself. Um, uh, it is amazing how irritating it is. Um, those of you who have experienced having your right arm immobilized um, and how difficult it makes life in many ways. And so the question I really want to ask is, should I have been saved from myself? Should I have been in some way held back from um, traveling too fast on a bicycle? Should I have even been stopped actually hiring the bicycle in the first place? Um, uh, or, um, uh, or do I have a right to undertake these activities, even if it imposes costs on others, even if it imposes costs on myself, uh, should my, do I not have a, 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 an autonomy uh, that should not be infringed uh, by the state? Uh, and of course, it, um, uh, it arises in a whole range of, the, uh, of areas, um, uh, health being the obvious case, and I should come to that, and health is the issue I should tend to be focused on. But those are the fundamental questions I want to ask. Should the state save people from themselves? Uh, and if, it, if we agree that it should or could, how should it do it? Should it ban risky activities? Should it regulate those activities? Or, as is very fashionable these days, should it try and nudge people into different ways of behaving? <laughs> I won't be able to go through all of that in great detail. There's a, there is a book that um, I'm producing with an ex-graduate student of mine, William New, who I'd like to, who, but many of whose ideas I shall be talking about. I'd like to pay tribute to him at the moment. Um, but um, that's the fundamental question I want to ask. If individuals engage in behaviour that harms no one but themselves, does the state have the right to intervene? And if so, are what is called libertarian paternalism, that is now more widely known as nudge, are they the appropriate way to go? So that's what I really want to talk about. Um, my interest in it arose, actually, because I worked for a couple of years uh, at 10 Downing Streets as a policy advisor to Tony Blair. Um, and um, uh, my, my job was to try to uh, encourage uh, the development of patient choice uh, and provide a competition uh, and also choice in education as well. Um, 
And, uh, but what I was also rather keen on was the um, proposal that was just coming forward at that time for banning smoking in public places. Um, and uh, on the second day of my appointment at number 10, I got, a, I got into a row with the Secretary of State for Health. I thought this probably wasn't a good career move, actually. Uh, it was John Reed at the time. Um, and because he um, was not at all keen on banning smoking in public places. Um, he had been a 50-a-day smoker himself, um, and his, his, uh, as indeed had his mother. Uh, and his mother, on her deathbed, dying of lung cancer, I may say, said to, uh, said to John Reed, John, for God's sake, don't ever let them ban smoking. <laughs> so, and he said, and he said, um, he uh, looked at me and he said, you know, here you are, an advocate of choice, freedom of choice, freedom of ability. Um, how can you reconcile that with your desire to ban people? from doing things. How can you reconcile this um, with your view? For example, what would be wrong, he said, in having a room in every restaurant, every pub, uh, into which um, no uh, staff would go? One of the chief arguments about banning smoking in public places was the cost of staff. Pat, on the whole, the passive smoking arguments are pretty weak, I think, but, the, um, but except for staff in, in restaurants um, and bars. Um, and... Uh, he said, well, what would be wrong with having such a room where people carry their own food, their own drink, and, um, and can smoke themselves as much to death as much as they like? And that's actually quite a difficult question to answer. Um, uh, particularly, at the end of the day, you probably have to admit to yourself, well, it'd be good for them if they were stopped doing it, and you end up with a paternalist position. And that sort of led me on to thinking about, well, well what's the justifications for this? Um, it's a big problem, and it's going to be the problem, it seems to me, of the next 40 years, um, is uh, in, particularly in health, but not only in health, but in other areas that I'll also mention. But just thinking about health, we have a lot of behaviour, of individual behaviour, uh, that uh, damages health, and it rises from a variety of causes, smoking, um, alcohol consumption, obesity, I used to, I called this in one of my lectures, I used to call this the giants of excess. It was a liberal reference to, um, uh, to um, uh, beverages, five giants. Uh, the five giants, which I, I'm usually rather embarrassed because I can never altogether remember what they were, but they were the five, the five giants of poverty, squalor, disease, sloth. And can anybody remember the fifth? What? Ignorance, thank you very much. Thank you. I was ignorant of ignorance. Uh, well, I was about to say, of course, they, they, these are not a problem any longer, except obviously for uh, people giving keynote lectures. Um, but the problems that we have nowadays, if anything, they, they were the giants of absence, uh, not enough income, not poor housing, poor education, poor health, and so on. Um, and now, we, in some senses, we have the giants of excess, of too much overconsumption, smoking, overconsumption of alcohol, too much overeating, not enough exercise, there's an absence for you, type of diet, and so on. Um, and indeed, I mean, this is a, a fairly rough calculation that was done by some, um, uh, some American epidemiologists um, uh, a few years ago that actually looked at the proportion of uh, premature mortality in the United States that resulted from what you might call uh, behavioural uh, uh, patterns. And as you can see from that, they concluded roughly about 40% uh, of premature deaths were due to behaviour in one kind or another. Uh, interesting, there, there, it's an interesting diagram that. You'll see healthcare is there. Healthcare, 10% of premature deaths in the United States are due to actually due to mistakes in healthcare. Oh, that's an extraordinary number, and I don't think I don't think Britain would be very different if we had the had the figures. Now, obviously, that's to some extent a dodgy calculation. Can we easily distinguish between behaviour and social circumstances? Um, people's behaviour are heavily determined by the social circumstances in which they live. Environmental factors too, obviously, determine that. Uh, and where did the genetic predisposition come from? I think it was just a residual, actually, in the calculation. Um, so. One needn't 
necessarily take the exact figures too seriously, but nonetheless, it's very clear that behavior is a very important determinant. Um, so, um, uh, what should we do about it in some senses? Um, uh, we encounter enormous, I mean, John Reed is not the only political, um, uh, is not the only political objector uh, to this kind of thing. When I was in number 10, we were talking about this, I began to get postcards of this kind um, from people who felt that uh, on the whole it was undesirable. Actually, on the reverse of this was an invitation to um, uh, a barbecue um, in which smokers were welcome. Uh, uh, but it illustrated, again, um, very much the degree of hostility there is among certain sections of the population, of the public, um, uh, and of the uh, establishment, to uh, the idea of the state trying to save people from themselves, the state acting as, quote, a nanny state. So, um, actually... Um, when we came to look at it, um, to investigate the sort of degree of paternalism that was already going on, uh, it was surprising the number of government policies that actually had a paternalistic element, or could be reasonably viewed as a paternalistic element in their justification. It wasn't their only, not their only justification. Of course, so often they were justified on redistributive grounds, on the grounds of... Uh, <clears throat> of correcting market failure and so on. Um, but quite often, many of them did seem to have... They, they were too strong, or they were too, they were too invasive, really, to be, uh, to, for that justification, those non-paternalistic justifications to be sufficient. Here are some examples of... Um, these are legal restrictions on, beha on behaviour that's risky, a behaviour that's undertaken for reasons that aren't intended to damage one's health or whatever... Um, but uh, do have this sort of the, the side effects and a variety of lists there. I won't um, read them, but you can see it's quite a long list. There's also legal restrictions not only on sort of behaviour that has a kind of byproduct of it, but also behaviour that is actually intentional behaviour, like policies that make suicide or assisted suicide illegal, sexual acts and so on, and it invalidates <laughs> contracts such as the sale of body parts uh, and so on. Um, there's taxes um, on cigarettes, sin taxes, smoking, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, tax on the fat content of food. Subsidies, uh, there are subsidies, um, subsidies to pensions, pension savings, subsidies to the arts, public service broadcasting, um, and giving aid to people in cash, in kind rather than in cash. Um, and when you go into it, again, for many, of course, they, these have a, uh, let me repeat, they have a variety of justifications. Um, but, um, but one of them does appear to be a fairly heavy dose of paternalism that comes through. Um, so, first of all, let, let me just talk a little bit about what we actually mean by paternalism. What are the definitions involved? Because it turns out to be actually quite difficult to define what paternalism, what paternalism is. Um, um, and you start from Mill's, uh, John Stuart Mill's harm principle, um, which is there, that the only purpose for which power may be rightfully exercised against his will is to prevent harm to others. Uh, his own good is not sufficient warrant. And you could say, well, a paternalistic policy essentially is one that, that by definition, um, invalidates or violates uh, Mill's harm principle. Um, so a paternalistic policy is one that simply interferes in people's freedom for their own good. Um, uh, this has been refined by various philosophers, Gerald Walk in the classic case, um, where paternalism is the interference with a person's liberty of action, no freedom or whatever, justified by reasons referring exclusively to the welfare, good, happiness, etc. Uh, of the person being coerced. Note the term coerced there. Um, um, the trouble is, it's not clear that a definition of that kind actually covers all the various acts that we would think of as paternalistic. Mill himself cites an example um, where uh, you see somebody walking towards a bridge, you know the bridge um, has, uh, uh, is uh, fragile and will not bear the weight um, of that person, you haven't got time to 
to inform them of this fact, because they're just about to step on the bridge, so you throw yourself in front of them and stop them. Um, uh, and that's clearly a paternalistic act, um, and yet um, uh, it's, it's not really clear that it, uh, it conforms to the Dworkin definition. Um, um, subsidies are another example. We subsidise the arts, uh, subsidies the opera and so on. It's hard, uh, and again, it's fairly clear that there's some paternalism going on there. There is some device to try to improve, to get people to improve themselves in some way. Uh, whether you think it's right or not is another question, but clearly that's part of the intention. But it's hard to say that you're really interfering with the liberty of action by providing lower prices. I mean, if anything, you're probably increasing the liberty of action because you're, you're increasing the range of... Um, of uh, choices open to them by reducing the prices of opera or whatever. Um, and the whole nudge policies. Um, uh, I expect many of you are familiar with this by now, but an ex a classic example, of course, is the switch of, um, uh, the, the, switch of the default from opt-in pension policies to opt-out pension policies, automatic enrolment in pensions, so that people have to make a decision to opt out of a pension scheme, which is now coming through in the UK, uh, instead of having to make a decision to opt in. Um, all that's happened there is that the default has been switched. The choices remain exactly the same. Um, people can still opt, can still go into a pension scheme or leave it. Um, it's just the default has been changed. Um, again, it's fairly clear that is a kind of paternalism going on in changing that default. But again, it's not clear that there's any coercion um, or interference involved. Um, uh, the nudge people themselves, um, uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, um, in their book Nudge, um, have come up with a definition of this kind, which, um, again, I don't think really quite uh, captures it. But Tolles is paternalism who tries to influence choices in a way that will make choosers better off, as judged by themselves. Um, I mean, it, for example, it includes what most people would not consider to be paternalistic, which is simply providing people with information, provide people with information about the choices they're making. Uh, it's not clear that's paternalism. Um, there may be paternalistic, more or less paternalistic ways of doing it, uh, and we might come to that, but the provision of information itself does not seem to be uh, intrinsically a paternalistic act. Um, and um, in this business about what would make people better off as judged by themselves, how do we actually find that out? Um, particularly if they are engaging in activities which we regard as risky or dangerous or damaging to themselves already, um, how do we actually find that out? So I don't think that definition uh, really goes. So um, uh, Bill, New and I have come to this definition. We think that it's probable, and it would be very interesting to have, I hope we're going to have a little time for discussion, um, um, that really you probably can't avoid defining paternalism uh, without referring in some way to the intentions of the paternalist. Um, and if you're talking about state paternalism, and I should mention, of course, that isn't the only kind of paternalism, um, there's professional paternalism uh, and individual paternalism of various kinds, but my focus is on state paternalism. A state intervention is paternalistic, if it involves addressing some failure of judgment uh, by the individual um, and the aim of intervening to address that failure of judgment is in order to further the individual's own good. And that's the definition by which we've, we've tended to work with. Um, um, what do we mean by failure of judgment? Well, I'll just come on to that for a moment. Um, but if we accept that as a a broader definition. Well, what are the what are the justifications one can think of for the state to intervene to correct somebody's judgment, somebody the mistakes they've made? Well, there are two. Um, there's the argument that it hurts the hurts it hurts third parties. Um, um, passive smoking might be a classic case. There's also another argument about cost of the state. Um, uh, so that, um, for instance, uh, people who stupidly have bicycle accidents um, uh, or, more generally, smokers or people who overeat or whatever, 
impose substantial costs on the National Health Service. Uh, and that gives the state, which is funding the National Health Service, a right to intervene in some way to try to reduce those costs. Uh, I think, I must say, I think that's a, that's, um, a difficult argument. Uh, I am not, in fact, about this, this cast, for instance, I actually ended up paying for it myself. It was remarkably cheap. The French Health Service, incidentally, very effective, very quick. Um, and uh, it only cost about 200 euros at the end of the day, which is not an enormous amount, I would say. Um, uh, but um, uh, if the state has taken a decision to fund something collectively, does that give it the right to intervene to stop people um, imposing costs on it? I'm not sure. I, th I think I find that a, a difficult argument. But also, I mean, there is a more pragmatic reason, is that um, sometimes it drives you in rather the wrong direction. There's quite an interesting Dutch study that some of you may be aware of that looks at the costs of healthy people to the state as compared to the costs of sick people to the state uh, over the years. Um, and as indeed we might expect, the costs of healthy people are considerably greater than the costs of uh, sick people. That's not only the costs of pensions, but even the costs of the health care, because, of course, they, they tend to live longer. Um, in fact, if you really go down this line, you probably would want to encourage people to smoke, um, because lung cancer pops people off about the age of 65. It doesn't cost very much, because there's not much we can do about lung cancer. Um, so, actually, I think this argument is, a, is an uncomfortable one. And, not, and in any case... <coughs> It isn't really paternalism if we do intervene to stop somebody hurting third parties. It's not really paternalism because paternalism, as we've said, uh, is a state intervention designed to further the individual's own good, not necessarily to protect third parties from that individual's actions. Um, a second justification for what might think of as paternally positive is what you might call autonomy failure. That is to say... Uh, there are certain groups, certain individuals, who you might feel are not really functioning as autonomous adults. Um, and hence, it's legitimate for the state to take over uh, their decision-making in various ways. Um, the classic case, sorry, um, the classic case, of course, is children, um, where we decide that they do not necessarily have the right, where paternalism comes from, presumably, the, the origins of the term. Um, um, where you are, well, perhaps parentalism might be a better term, where you actually intervene um, to uh, take decisions for individuals who don't regard autonomy. Certain kinds of mental illness um, you might wish to include in that category, addiction, um, and so on. Again, I think you have to be a little careful here, um, because the fact that someone is a child, um, or indeed, or let's say a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old, surely does not mean that you have a right to completely... Um, erode their autonomy, or erode their, um, indeed, some of you have mental illness. You have the right completely to erode their autonomy. There are still questions here. Um, but again, um, and again, uh, it's not quite the issue with which we wish to address, which is more, does the state have the right to intervene fully autonomous individuals? Um, for individuals who we would all agree are have a degree, have an, have an autonomy, have a right to autonomy, um, does it have a right to nonetheless erode that autonomy in some way by paternalistic means? Um, um, well, there are probably two kinds of, um, uh, of uh, failure of judgment which individuals make where you might consider that the state has a, a right to intervene. Um, one, uh, and here it's useful to distinguish between people's ends and people's means of achieving those ends. Um, the ends uh, that individuals have are the ends essentially of, their, of the good life. It's the values, it's the things that they're trying to achieve. Um, it's the, the aims, the purposes of their life. Um, that sort of fundamental set of ends, of objectives that they're trying to um, achieve. Um, the means are the means they use to get there. Um, and it seems to me that the state uh, can, uh, can regard failures of judgment in both ends and means. Um, and I think it's an interesting question. Again, the justification, rather, I'll move on from this. We did discuss autonomy failure. 
Um, that's when the state disapproves of the ends that individuals themselves have voluntarily chosen. Um, uh, and examples are outlawing suicide, um, sexual practicing, <coughs> sending out adults, and so on, religious observances. Um, here the state, the state just simply makes a judgment that it finds for whatever reason, moral or, or others, it just disapproves of those ends and it will intervene to stop individuals uh, doing uh, uh, I think it's very difficult for anybody of a moderately liberal persuasion to <coughs> accept this as a legitimate um, reason for the state to intervene. Um, um, it's... Uh, and. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to think. I mean, how how, how the use of the word failure in this uh, in the, is 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 itself curious. How can you actually describe somebody as failing to achieve, uh, failing to meet uh, in choosing their ends? Um, there seems to be some sort of almost a, a, a logical disconnect there. Um, on the other hand, means failure, or what we might term reasoning failure, is where people uh, actually fail, they, they have their set of ends, they know what they want to do, want to achieve, but to get there is, uh, but they make mistakes in a sense in getting there. And it seems, and they can make mistakes in, uh, at least we think of about four different ways. Um, again, I don't have time to go through these in great detail, but um, limited technical ability, they might be able to process the information properly, decision overload, too many choices, which is um, a problem that's often levied at uh, my arguments for choice in the, in the public sector. Um, limited imagination experience, difficult to put themselves into. I mean, the 18-year-old who starts smoking finds it very difficult, uh, understandably, to put themselves in the, uh, the situation of um, a 50-year-old or a 60-year-old um, with lung cancer. Um, and indeed, uh, myopia, which is uh, listed there as one of the kind of effects, um, seems to be one of the major reasons uh, why the major example of reasoning failure, uh, and we might move on to discuss that. There are various other things listed there, say it's going bias, endowment effect. Those of you who, who know the behavioral economics literature will know um, a bit about those, um, but I won't go into them in detail now because of time. Limited willpower, uh, uh, one sense to procrastinate, addiction itself you could regard as that, you don't regard it as, as, a, as a threat to autonomy. Um, and uh, what Aristotle called the crazier, uh, which basically means a uh, weakness of the will, um, something we're all familiar with. Um, and limited objectivity, um, the, the difficulty of standing back from a decision. Um, most decisions are loaded in some way with emotional baggage of various kinds. It's sometimes very difficult to stand back from that um, and, uh, and actually make uh, an objective decision as to what would be best for you in the circumstances. Um, now, there's quite a lot of evidence. It's coming out of psychology. It's coming out of behavioral, uh, in behavioral economics and behavioral psychology, showing that individuals do make a lot of mistakes of these kinds. Um, uh, that uh, individuals who they want to stop smoking, that is their end, or more fundamentally their end is to have good health, um, uh, but um, they make mistakes on the way. They make mistakes getting there. Um, and um, in those areas, um, it would seem, to, uh, it seems to us, and we argue in the book, this is, there is a legitimate role here for the state, that the state could intervene to, uh, to correct these mistakes so as to enable individuals the better to achieve the ends that they themselves have voluntarily chosen. Um, uh, we are, in some sense, the first to um, um, observe this. There's a classic quote from David Hume. Um, again, looking particularly at what we call the myopia problem, the problem that, and particularly, it arises particularly in the health case, but it also arises in cases of pensions or indeed choices about higher education, that many of the benefits um, from uh, undertaking or from uh, not undertaking the relevant behavior um, accrue a long time in the future, whereas the costs are immediate. Uh, and uh, the longer that distance, it seems to me, between the 
the benefits from um, the changing one's behaviour uh, and the costs, the, the time distance, the longer that distance, the greater the justification for some form of state intervention. Um, so, where does that leave us? A paternalist state um, intervention is justifiable <laughs> if there is a demonstrable failure of reasoning by the majority of individuals affected by the intervention, uh, leading to a significant welfare loss for those individuals. Um, the state can do better for those individuals, and that's incidentally a point um, that I wanted to, that um, again I don't have time to go into great detail here, but um, it isn't only sufficient to show that they, uh, for, to justify state intervention, to show that there's a reasoning failure, we've got to show that the state in some sense can and will do better uh, than the individual themselves if they intervene. Um, and ideally, there are relatively few individuals without reasoning failure who are affected by the intervention. And the loss in welfare to each of them from the intervention is relatively small. And ideally, that the impact on autonomy uh, of the intervention on both groups is small. Um, so those are the kind of criteria we would like to apply to justify the state intervening. Uh, in particular areas. Um, now let me just conclude then by just briefly talking about um, the various ways in which the state might intervene. Um, provision of information is a classic way of course. Um, I think we've agreed or certainly um, uh, our view uh, is that this is not actually paternalism, that simple provision of information is not paternalism. Now, there may be different, there may be paternalistic ways of providing uh, the information. Uh, there's a classic example about that if you, uh, if you tell people um, about the death rate from a certain operation, let's say it's 5% death rate, uh, for that operation, you get a very different numbers of people opting to have the operation than if you tell them what the survival rate from that operation is. So if you tell them it's 95% survival, many people opt for the operation, you tell them it's 5% death, uh, uh, far fewer people do. Exactly the same information, but you're presenting it in a subtly different way, and some people would argue that is a paternalistic intervention by shifting the kind of uh, intervention. Uh, regulation, subsidy, tax, we've mentioned all these as ways of undertaking and, it, and it's quite interesting to go through the various criteria that I've I laid out before um, that to see how they fit the, uh, the device. Regulation, for example, one of the problems with regulation is that it hits both those with reasoning failure and those without reasoning failure. It hits not only the 70% of smokers who want to give up smoking and say they want to give up smoking, uh, and it also hits the 30% who, who say they do not wish to give up smoking and are very firm and are well informed. Um, um, uh, and indeed, you'll probably see the spokesperson of David Hockney, I think, is the current spokesperson of that uh, line. Um, um, Subsidy, again, you can go through and look at the, um, uh, at the various impact on these criteria that we talked about. I would just finish talking about um, libertarian paternalism, the nudge idea, um, and how that meets the criteria. I mean, um, if we look back at these criteria here and we think about nudge ideas, actually, I'm sorry, let, let me first of all just mention one or two what nudge ideas are for those who haven't come across it. Um, the debate called libertarian paternalism, um, I have to say, I was, when I was trying to sell libertarian paternalism to Department of Health, I talked to the permanent secretary once and, uh, and she said, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't like libertarians and I don't like paternalists. Why would I like both of these put together? Uh, um, but the idea is that publicly private institutions might nudge people in directions that will make life go better without eliminating freedom of choice. Classic examples, some of which I've already mentioned, I mentioned are the framing of decisions, such as the, the framing of the survival rate versus the death rate of operations, the default position, opt-in, opt-out for pensions, another classic uh, case. Organ donation is another one. 
Um, there is some evidence that, um, that countries that have an opt-out scheme for organ donation by which you actually have to carry a card saying you do not wish your organs to be donated in the event of a fatal accident um, has a much higher level of organ provision um, for donation, uh, for transfer purposes um, than do opt-in uh, systems uh, where you have to carry a card saying you are willing to be donated. Um, um, so uh, these are all examples of kind of libertarian ideas. Um, I think one of the problems with it, with the libertarian paternalistic ideas, um, uh, as you can see, if we go back, sorry, let me talk about the advantages first of all. As you can see, on the whole, they will meet most of those criteria. <coughs> Um, and in particular, that, um, that on the whole, the people can opt out. The, sort of the, the fully informed, the rational, the people not suffering reason of failure can uh, opt out. Um, and, um, and so they don't have a great deal of intervention, a great loss um, of welfare from the intervention. Uh, and many people think that's one of the... And the impact on autonomy is relatively small. Um, I think the problem with libertarian return is it's quite difficult to think of ideas um, outside some of the standard ones like the opt-in, opt-out, whether it's really got a purchase across the wide range of public policy. Um, I did spend some time trying to think about this when I was running something called Health England, which was a, um, a government sort of forerunner of public health, what's now Public Health England. Um, and um, we came up with some ideas. Um, I was trying to think about smoking. Is there some way of having an opt-in scheme for smoking by which smokers have to make a decision every year to opt in to being a smoker? Um, and the idea I came up with was um, a, uh, um, a permit to smoke. Um, you have to buy a permit every year. You have, you have, to, you have to go along to the... Um, uh, the post office, you have to supply ID, fill out a form. The form could be quite complicated. You know, I mean, you, you, we're good at, government's good at making complicated forms. Maybe even pay a small charge, £10, something like that. Maybe even have a doctor's signature, although I don't think the doctors would necessarily uh, <laughs> go along with that. Um, and, um, and it seems to me that it would, you, so every year you'd have to opt in to uh, making it. So start, it looks like it would stop people starting. Um, uh, and probably more effective than price rises, there's some evidence on that. Of course, I'm sure you're immediately ticking off in your head all the problems that there would be with it. Um, enforcement, how would you make sure that people didn't just borrow somebody else's ID and, uh, and so on. Regressive, well, um, we might uh, come to that. In fact, actually, marginal increases in tobacco tax are progressive, and maybe we could make an argument there. Um, Various other ideas um, we had too. Um, a fat tax that's now become much more popular. Uh, this is all. This is a good few years ago now. Um, exercise hour. Every firm that employing over 500 employees um, would automatically enrol its employees um, in an exercise hour every week, um, uh, which uh, from which employees could opt out if they wished, but they'd have to do so by writing to the chief executive and saying that, <laughs> saying that they wish to spend that hour working instead. Um, uh, salt packs in processed foods, instead of having pro a lot of processed foods, have a lot of salt in them. Um, take, um, why not have the salt packs on the side, so to speak, so if people want to add the, to the process, they can. Separate alcohol, alcohol. Uh, in the United States, some states in the United States, they have rather down at heel, dingy alcohol selling outlets. They're not part of the sort of fashionable uh, outlet. Um, marriage default, yes, that's... Um, uh, <coughs> this, this one got me into trouble. Um, uh, this was the idea that um, uh, uh, cohabiting couples, if cohabiting couples had a child, um, the moment that the birth certificate was signed for that child, um, both partners would be regarded by the law as married. Um, uh, they could then divorce. They could then, they, they, they could, however, then they, they would both have the same degree of property rights over each other's properties, pensions, and so on they previously had. Um, uh, this is partly motivated by the fact that um, when cohabiting couples split up, as many of you know, well, no, there's a lot of evidence that women, particularly, 
um, fall into poverty very fast, and they have no rights, or they have very few rights over the um, over the uh, property or pensions or whatever of their partner, uh, their ex-partner. So this was a, again a device to uh, try to help resolve that. Um, when these ideas came out, um, I, in the course of a, con I, I've had not a wholly uncontroversial career, um, but this was the only time I've really been monstered by the by the tabloids. Um, <laughs> Uh, they really went to town on this one, um, uh, and um, and then it got picked up in the United States, um, uh, and uh, my email inbox exploded, um, uh, mostly with pictures of Hitler. Um, uh, Hitler, Mussolini, got quite a few of Mussolini, um, and uh, Mao Zedong. Um, I didn't know that Hitler was an avid um, vegetarian, avid non-smoker. I mean, people know this. Okay, um, and you won't be able to read that, but basically, uh, this is some of the feedback from some of the email messages I got. Um, but basically, what they 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 they're rather like the exercise hour. The exercise hour went down went down quite well, um, but um, but the smoking permit was not a success. But perhaps it illustrates that. It, when you walk in this area, it is quite dangerous, and you might even end up breaking your arm. <laughs> Thank you.